Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Not Sabbath here yet. But it will be not too long from now. And uh, welcome to the Friday night study. So um, we were continuing our study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we're going through uh, this document here, which is M. L. Andreasen's Letters to the Churches. He's addressing what happened in the 1950s um, that led to the publication of the book, Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine, often referred to simply as Questions on Doctrine. Um, it's a controversial book. It, it, it was a step in a direction uh, in our lines. We mark the th third generation uh, with the publication of a book called uh, The Doctrine of Christ by um, um, uh, W.W. Prescott. And the third generation ends with this book, Seventh-day Adventist question or answer questions on doctrine. Starting to sound like a little bit like Joe Biden. Um, not being able to put my sentences together properly. But anyway, um, so we have this this uh, this book that was put out by M. L. Andreasen, and I read this a long time ago. Uh, back in 1984-85, somewhere in there, uh, or probably 85-86. Now, <clears throat> I had the first book I read after I got baptized on December 25th, 1982, was the book by Walter Martin that is going to be referred to here, uh, called Kingdom of the Cults, and it has in it an appendix called The Puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism. And that appendix, uh, the reason why uh, Seventh-day Adventists are answering questions on doctrine has to do with the fact that um, Eternity Magazine, which uh, Dr. Barnhouse, uh, Donald Barnhouse, was the editor, and Walter Martin was a young guy who was... Uh, publishing in that magazine, Eternity Magazine, an evangelical periodical. And um, he had been writing about cults and, and working on this book on the kingdom of the cults. And so they thought they would go to the Seventh-day Adventists directly and ask them some questions about what they believed. Well, uh, these this group of leaders of the church, um, they decided to have these secret meetings with the evangelicals and basically lie to them about what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Um, later on, Walter Martin did recognize that he was lied to, um, which didn't make him happy. I know he did go as a student, from what I've heard, or not a student, but as a patient to uh, Weimar um, with, uh, to help him with his diabetes. Um, and so some people who, who knew him said that, you know, he, he recognized that he was lied to by, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist leadership about what Seventh-day Adventists believe. So, so this, this history is not completely known by most Adventists. Um, it used to be a bit more known by conservative Adventists. But I would say that most Adventists nowadays don't nowadays don't know much about this history. It's sort of old news and it's just not exciting enough, I guess, for newer Adventists. And it's definitely not promoted in the church. Um, it's almost seen as a conspiracy theory within the church, um, but it is a factual story. And um, at the time, M. L. Andreessen, an Adventist minister, uh, had uh, known about these meetings and the results of these meetings. So he's he's informing people about what was happening. Now, we're going to read through this and we're going to discuss it a little bit. So anybody who wants to uh, make a comment or ask a question, feel free to do so. 
um, I'll make, you know, the odd comment here and there. But um, we're going to start reading here. So this section here, this is, oh, we have to pray first. Thank you for reminding me, Rat. Sometimes I go on these preambles and I forget. So let's open with a word of prayer. A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the Sabbath that's coming and uh, for these uh, things that we have been looking at over the last um, couple of years regarding um, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. We know, Lord, that there's so much that we do not understand in your word and that we come as students asking your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We know, Lord, that this history of our church has to some degree been buried. Um, it's been forgotten for the most part. Um, but we know, Lord, that um, it's essential for us to know our history. Those that fail to understand their history are doomed to repeat it. And we know that Adventism is once again uh, dealing with a crisis based upon the ignorance of what has happened in the past. So we just invite your Holy Spirit to teach us, to be with us, to encourage us as we look forward to the Sabbath. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so this section here, uh, the same procedure. Uh, what he's saying is that there was this, uh, a procedure regarding uh, how the leadership dealt with uh, Revelation 13 and that they had uh, excised that from the study on the book of Revelation in a quarterly. Um, so he goes on, he says, but this is not all. But Dr. Barnhouse reports that the same procedure was repeated regarding the nature of Christ while in the flesh, the subject, subject with which we have been here dealing. Our leaders assured Mr. Martin that the majority of the denomination has always held the nature of Christ while in the flesh to be sinless, holy, and perfect, despite the fact that certain of their writers have occasionally gotten into print with contrary views, completely repugnant to the church at large. So Andreasen goes on, he says, if our leaders told Mr. Martin this, um, they told the greatest truth, un untruth ever, the greatest untruth ever, which is a lie. For the denomination has never held any other view than that expressed by Mrs. White in the quotations used in this article. We challenge our leaders or anybody to produce proof of their assertion. How grossly untrue is the statement that certain writers got into print with views completely repugnant to the church at large? Mrs. White was one of those writers who got it in, got into print. And here also what our standard book, here also what our standard book, Bible Readings for the Home Circle, sold to the public by the millions, has to say on the subject. I have before me two copies, one printed by the Pacific Press in 1916 and the other by the Southern Publishing House in 1944. They both read alike. Here is the accepted teaching by the denomination. In his humanity, Christ partook of our sinful fallen nature. If not, then he was not made like unto his brethren, was not in all points tempted like as we are did not overcome as we have to overcome and is not therefore the complete and perfect savior man needs and must have to be saved. The idea that Christ was born of an immaculate or sinless mother, Protestants not to, do not claim this for the Virgin Mary, inherited no tendencies to sin and for this reason did not sin, removes him from the realm of a fallen world and from the very place where help is needed on his human side, Christ inherited just what every child of Adam inherits, a sinful, fallen nature. On the divine side, from his very conception, he was begotten and born of the Spirit. 
And this was done to place mankind on vantage ground and to demonstrate that in the same way, everyone who is born of the spirit may gain like victories over sin in his own sinful flesh. Thus, each one is to overcome as Christ overcame. Without this birth, there can be no victory over temptation and no salvation from sin. So that's page 21 from Bible readings for the home. Now, in our upper room Bible studies back that started back on April 20th, 1985, uh, we did go through um, Bible readings for the home, not the entire book, but we went through parts of it, uh, parts dealing with the nature of Christ and and parts dealing with uh, the prophecies. Now, the, the question I have is why why did our leadership lie to the evangelicals regarding this belief? Is this something that um, Adventists should be ashamed of? You know, wh- why this one doctrine? I mean, there's another doctrine, of course. There's two main issues. You know, one has to do with the... Yeah. A, a different a different word comes to mind, and that's intrigued. I'm intrigued. Why? Why? Intrigued by... <laughs> I'm intrigued yeah. by the question because it's so it's so mysterious. Really, it's, yeah, it's it is. like showing twelve sixty and twelve sixty to someone, and they can't add it up. It's yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, and because to me, it's it's such a clear understanding that Adventists have on the nature of Christ. I mean, it's hard to be a Seventh-day Adventist and read Desire of Ages and not know that Ellen White taught that Christ took man's nature in its fallen condition. Right? Not the nature of man before Adam fell, but inherited, you know, all the liabilities of human nature. Well, Well, here's the thing. I said no, because it must not be so clear if so many are not seeing it. Mm-hmm. Or what? You know, it's it, it's not as clear as some people think because it's been, you know, messed up, mixed up by so many things. Well, but it wasn't That's mixed up. Talk about winds of doctrine. Yeah. So since the 1950s, definitely uh, because of this attack on the nature of Christ, um, mm-hmm. Adventists are confused about it, but no Adventist was confused about it in the 1950s. You don't, you don't have any. Why is Adventists. it so critical? Yeah. And why is it so critical? Well, why? I mean, as as it says here from uh, question, um, not from questions on doctrine, from Bible readings for the home. Um, if we are to, if we are to ha- understand salvation, that that we can overcome sin. That Christ gives us a victory in human nature. I mean, it's it's the whole gospel is so, tied up well, in understanding the nature of Christ. That, thank you. Yeah, that's a good answer. Now, you know, I, and and you've been you've seen some of the discussions I'm having with our friend Adam on uh, Facebook regarding uh, Christ's divine nature. The, you know, the Trinity Godhead issue. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Ellen White says, understanding particularly how to explain the nature of God is not really important. There are certain things we need to know. Mm-hmm. We need to know that mm-hmm. Jesus is God. It's sacred, gra- it's sacred ground. It's yeah, sacred well, ground. We need to take our shoes off. Because it is not possible for us to understand God's nature. Um, so Great. we need to know that Jesus is is fully God, right? That's Hebrews chapter one, because there's there's two sides to this coin, so to speak, of salvation. There's Christ's humanity and his divinity. So his divinity is is just as necessary for salvation uh, as mm-hmm. is his humanity. That is, if he isn't God, if he's just a created being. He can't really be our savior. Mm. He can't connect us to God. And and man, if he's not, yeah, must, man must connect to God. Man must connect to God through divinity as Christ did, and had yes. to. 
Yeah. Right. Is that right? So Christ is yeah. that ladder that can he gives us the example of how to connect to God. He's the ladder between heaven and earth that Jacob saw. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um so so he has to be fully God. Now, in some ways there are things about that that we can't fully comprehend. Um we know that he is begotten, that he didn't yes. just become the Ooh, son man. of God when he became a man. What's that? Just a few of them that we can't comprehend. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a few things. Kind of being light about it, right? I mean, <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's lots of it because we don't really even understand what God is. I mean, we know God is love mm. and we know that he's spirit. Mm. That is, he's not material. He's not a part and of we know that he is. And each converted person knows that he is undeni- undeniable. If yeah. we're converted, we know God is. Well, we, yeah, you know, we have to know that he is and that he is uh, our savior. Mm-hmm. Right? He's a sanctifier of those mm-hmm. that believe us in Christ. Yeah. But, you know, so if you're going to come to God, you must believe that he is, that he exists. Mm-hmm. And and you have to understand things about his character, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we need to understand it, God's that he love. Is. So, that, that's sort of, that he is, is sort of like, I am because I am and he's everything he is and he is whatever you might bring up. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's this uh, lady, this black lady, Ian is her name, uh, who mm-hmm. uh, recently became a Christian and she had a debate, so to speak, with Richard Dawkins. And she said, you know, well, the the difference between you and I is that, you don't you believe that there's nothing and she says i believe that there is something and, and mm-hmm. you know so this basic belief in god that god exists is is essential but we need to know that he exists and is he a, he is a rewarder of those um you know that he's going to save those who come to him right to believe in christ so we have to understand things about his nature certain things but there are things that you just aren't revealed in God's word and that would be incomprehensible to us because we, we don't really know what spirit yeah. is. Uh, and so when in, yeah. you know, when the, the Bible tries to say he's, you know, consubstantial, that the father and the son are co, con, uh, co uh, substantial, co-substantial, um, co-eternal, things like this. Uh, we don't really know what that means. Do we understand what eternity means? Well, in the first one, stop there, co-substantial, that would mean the same thing exactly. But he, Jesus is the son. He, he's not the father. Right. So there's so something are they, yeah. different. And they're both yeah, so To say they're of the same substance, I mean, are they made out of a substance? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's so, the mysterious part of it. Right. Iniquity. So, so how can you say something? The Bible doesn't say anything about other than that they're their spirit, which means that they're immaterial. So if they're immaterial, that means they don't have any substance yeah. that we understand. So uh, we don't really know, right? Mm-hmm. What we do know is that Christ was begotten in the days of eternity. He wasn't begotten just when he became a man. Um, days of old. Yeah. Yeah. Days so, of old, is it? Yeah. Or something. Ancient yeah. days. Yeah. yeah, he was his goings forth have been from old, from yeah. everlasting or something like that. From, from the days of eternity. That's right. So so Christ yeah. and so Christ came forth from the Father in some way, whatever that means, in an eternity time ago, whatever that means, right? Well so, yeah. so Christ is eternal it's time. Though. Well, it's, it's just not time, though. We can't even call it time. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, and yeah. It's, so so all we know is that it has nothing to do with time. But so people right. make a deal out of, of these types of things. These are not salvational issues. They, they don't affect our salvation in how we, we look at this paragraph here, whether we, mm-hmm. we understand that Christ is God. How is he God? What does that mean specifically? 
Uh, we know he acts as a servant, right? He's the son. He's not the father, mm-hmm. right? They couldn't just switch roles as uh, right. our South School Quarterly a few years ago tried to say that, you know, they basically. What? Like, like, like twins trading place at school? Yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. You know, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. It's almost like they had a coin toss to see who was going to be the Father, who was going to be the Son, and who was going to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, I may be being a little bit facetious, but it's not much far from that um, in what was yeah. presented in the Sabbath School Quarterly. Now, we have to yeah. realize the Catholics don't teach that about the Trinity. So whatever the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches about the Trinity presently, it's not Catholic. The Catholics do not believe that the Father can be the Son and the Son can be the Father. They they say they're very distinct. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I was I was yeah. rather well. Surprised. Is that what's going on now? Is that what you're hearing in the in the in the theology schools? In in the Adventist Church, they're teaching that yeah. they're they can just be interchanged. Yeah. Well, when you say they, when you say they, who, who are they? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they can be interchanged. No, no, Who's that, are, that are teaching, yeah, teaching that stuff. It just was in our quarterly, right? Oh, okay. And it's from the pulpit, right? So well, this is how the any, church... Any was, idea who is writing the quarterly? Any idea who is writing the no, quarterly? I don't that year? That's right. always interesting. So yeah. part of this comes from this debate about the Trinity, and it, it's sort of reactionary. Like, this is not something that the Adventist Church taught in the 80s when they first, you know, changed our statement about the Godhead. Um, mm. So, um, but but the point is, you know, there's so much misinformation. Uh, as we know, the Internet is an echo chamber. Um, if mm. you actually yeah. go back and read, you know, the Catholic ch- Church teaches that Jesus is the literal son of God. He's not just now they believe in eternal regeneration or eternal generation, which is is just kind of a mystical number mumbo jumbo. The idea is that, you know, he's always being born from the father, but it doesn't really mean anything. Okay. They, okay. they still believe him to be the son of God, not that, you know, he's just taking that role and, and the Holy Spirit could have taken that role. Right. So. So it, it just kind of bothers me anyway that people are making this whole issue of something that can't be understood, that, that there isn't even agreement on, uh, you know, within the Christian community how to understand this as as an issue of salvation. We, we should set that aside and say it's something we can't understand, but there are things that we need to understand. We need to understand Jesus is God, that he's not just um, a created being. And we need to understand that he's fully God and that he also is fully man, that he's not role playing as a man. You know, he's not pretending to be a man or to look like a man. Uh, He actually becomes one with the human race forever to bear our humanity. Right. And and that's not when he becomes the son of God. He doesn't become the son, the son of God when he takes upon our humanity. He is the son of God from eternity. Right. So so these are important points. The other points are just speculative ideas that can't be supported from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. <clears throat> OK. So the question then, going back to this intriguing question, as Kelly put it. You know, why did the church yield on this point? And and I've thought about it. I mean, it I mean, we know first that the evangelicals, it was an important point for them. So these are going to be points that they say make Seventh day Adventist a cult because they would look at this idea that Jesus having a sinful fallen nature as part of uh, what led us to the legalism of Sabbath keeping, right? So from the evangelicals point of view, we need to, you know, as we know, like Baptists, uh, you know, once saved, always saved. Um, You know, we're just sinners by nature, so we'll always sin. And so it doesn't really matter if we sin, we just have to believe in Jesus, right? So there's a doctrinal issue that was important to the evangelicals. 
And, and what the church really tried to do, or what the leadership tried to do, was just yield that point so that they would not be labeled as a cult. And of course, the other issue dealing with um, the atonement, is it completed at the cross or is atonement ongoing? Again, they yielded this. Now, partly what they did is they changed, they used a definitional argument. That is, they changed what they meant by the words they used. Um, I remember uh, this has been in the 1980s. I was at my parents' place and I was looking at the, uh, the church bulletin uh, from the United Church of Canada. And um, I was reading the, their statement of beliefs. And uh, they said that we believe that the Bible is the word of God. And I thought, well, that's pretty strange because my dad says, you know, the Bible's just uh, a, 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 like a Reader's Digest. And it's uh, the Reader's Digest is more inspired than the Bible. So I asked my dad about it. Well, and then he just said, well, you know, of course, the Bible is the word of God. So is so is the Reader's Digest. So um, but the point there is that they could take something like the word of God and just redefine it. And that's partly what has happened within Adventism. So when we talk about Christ's nature, uh, we we have obfuscated the whole issue by redefining the words that we use. And, and that, of course, uh, doesn't help the situation. <clears throat> okay, so let's go on here. It says, um, in explanation of how these writers got into print with their views, our leaders told Mr. Martin, that they had among their number certain members of their lunatic fringe, even as there are similar wide-eyed irresponsibles in every field of fundamental Christianity. I think this is going too far. Mrs. White did not belong to the lunatic fringe who got into print, nor did the authors of Bible readings. Our leaders should make a most humble apology to the denomination for such a slur upon their members. It is almost unbelievable that they should ever have made uh, such statements, uh, but the accusation has been in print for nearly three years, and there's been no protest of any kind, and I'm humiliated that such accusations should have been made, and even more so that our leaders are completely callous in their attitude toward them. Now, we, we think about this, this is, you know, the 1950s, um, that was a little while ago, uh, I became a an, an Seventh-day Adventist, you know, about 30 years after that, um, definitely this whole issue was buried um, within the church, you know, for the, for the common person. I, I know many Adventists, when I became an Adventist, they thought Questions on Doctrine was a wonderful book. They didn't know there was any problem with it. Um, you know, because of how the words were defined, they could read it and not see the problems with it. Um, but a seed had been planted uh, that has bore fruit over time. Uh, that the reader may see for himself the original report of Dr. Barnhouse, I herewith reproduce portions of the reprint, our Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Now, this is part of the thing of, uh, that ended up in the puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, that book, Kingdom of the Cults. Uh, part of this is in that book. This is not the, the report in full, but only that part which relates to the questions here discussed. Later, I shall present other extracts. So this, remember, this is Donald, Donald Barnhouse. Um, a little less than two years ago, I was decided that Mr. Martin should undertake research in connection with Seventh-day Adventists. And we got into touch with the Adventists saying that we wish to treat them fairly and would appreciate the opportunity of interviewing some of their leaders. The response was immediate and enthusiastic. Mr. Martin went to Tacoma Park, Washington, D.C., the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. At first, the two groups looked upon each other with great suspicion, and Mr. Martin had read a vast quantity of Adventist literature and presented them with a series of approximately 40 questions concerning their theological position. On a second visit, he was presented with scores of pages of detailed theological answers to his questions. Immediately, it was perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions which had been previously attributed to them. Now, 
one of the things uh, that the Adventists have done here in this time, and and we may have done it ourselves. I know I have at times. I've downplayed when I'm discussing with somebody who's antagonistic towards Adventism. I might downplay uh, some positions um, that I have and try to direct them in, in other directions uh, to have a discussion with them. I don't want to have a battle over something where, um, you know, they sort of, sort of seem to be armed. I try to find common ground. And in some ways, that that's sort of natural, um, unless you're, you know, an antagonistic person and like ha- likes having a fight, which I don't think most of us are. Um, so, you know, you, you try to find common ground. And, um, and, and it could be, you know, that's I, I think initially it's how we started out. Yeah, awesome. What's that? I think yeah. it's also a, a good thing, right? To be yeah, yeah, I think, uh, conciliatory. conciliatory. Yeah, like you know, right. instead so, of just heading on into an argument. Not sure where you're going going with that. Well, I'm just saying I I have sometimes downplayed uh, my position on certain things, just you so that I'm over I would downplayed be able to or downplayed. Just do you mean over downplayed or downplayed? Because downplay is not not a bad thing necessarily by itself. Well, but, but sometimes it's like you know you just kind of concede the point. You don't really argue that point, and you try to deal with something else. Yep. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. now. Yeah. For yeah. now. Not not right. necessarily concede the point. So that's kind of what they were doing. You're thinking. Yeah. Like when 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 a Jehovah's Witness comes and they start talking to me, and they start attacking, you mm-hmm. know. You know, uh, the Trinity or something. You know, I might, I might say, well, yeah, I don't really agree with the Catholic Trinity. You know, Um, you know, so I I might, you know, just not argue on that point. And so they could get the impression, oh, you know, I agree with them about, you know, Christ or whatever. Um, It's it's similar to I like to say, well, tell me about that Trinity or that God that you don't believe. mm -hmm. Or yeah, and I'll say, well, yeah. I don't believe that God either. Yeah, and that's so, that's one way to. Yeah. But 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 you know, as the leadership of the, um, you know, as the leadership of the Adventist Church to make this sort of uh, position, they must know that that this isn't just to start a discussion about things, that they are sort of giving up ground, right? They're, um, the they're, way they're going on. They're going on. They're going on record. They went on yeah, record. And, that's, now, that's I, and I think part of it is what they were doing was sort of a a definitional sort of agreement. Well, yes, of course, you know, Jesus never had a sinful human nature because, you know, he, he never sinned, right? So, and, and of course, you know, there's atonement is, is completed at the cross, you know, because Christ's sacrifice is complete atonement, right? But failing to take into position mm-hmm. that atonement... The sacrifice for the atonement was completed at the cross, but there is still ongoing atonement. And that, uh, you know, definitely Christ didn't sin. But to the evangelical, the idea of having a sinful nature means that Christ did sin, right? Because mm-hmm. you're a sinner yeah. by nature. So instead of, instead yeah. of, yeah, instead of the holding idea. it, down, they sort of buy into the, to some of the presuppositions of the evangelicals. And the well, not to end, but the idea that to not sin is an impossibility in the realms of they just can't comprehend that that could ever be possible because of our experience, we don't really. It's by faith that we can only think that we can not sin. If we imagine we can, then we can't or won't or whatever, you know. I mean, we won't if we imagine we can. Of course, God in us, cooperating with him. That's the key. Humanity and divinity combined. Yeah. Um, Okay. So um, he he goes on. This is Donald Barnhouse going on. He says, as Mr. Martin read their answers, he came, for example, upon a statement that they repudiated absolutely the thought that the Seventh-day Sabbath keeping was a basis for salvation and a denial of any teaching that the keeping of the first day of the week is as yet considered to be receiving uh, the anti-Christian mark of the beast. 
He pointed out to them that in their bookstore adjoining the building in which these meetings were taking place, a, a certain volume uh, published by them and written by one of their ministers categorically stated the contrary to what they were now asserting. The leader sent for the book, discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, and immediately brought this fact to the attention of the general conference officers, that this situation might be remedied and such publications be corrected. The same procedure was repeated regarding the nature of Christ, while in the flesh, which the majority of the denomination has always held to be sinless, holy, and perfect, uh, despite the fact that certain of their writers have occasionally gotten into print, the contrary view is completely repugnant to the church at large, right? They further explained to Mr. Martin that they had among their number certain members of their lunatic fringe, even as there are similar wide-eyed irresponsibilities in every field of fundamental Christianity. This action of the Seventh-day Adventists was indicative of similar steps that were taken subsequently. Now, now we, of course, would take the position that Sunday keeping isn't yet the mark of the beast. There comes a point in which that is. So some of these things... Um, you know, can be overstated in a book. But I, I have a d difficulty with the church sort of correcting uh, literature. You know, that's, uh, I've, I've never liked this idea. Um, you know, people are going to express things differently. You, you can't have this, we don't have a church where have this uniform literature being produced. That's more like a cult. So, um Anyway, he goes on, Mr. Martin's the, book. What, what's that? It's, the, having the imprimatur, right? The seal yeah, of the, the imprimatur, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that somehow every book put out by a church has to, you know, have some specific certain uh, clarity Helpful in thing. everything that it's saying. You know, like you're going to have it. committees basically writing every book. Um, no, the books you're talking about, are you talking about looking to other churches' books or just in our publishing houses? Well, in our publishing house, the fact that they're going about correcting our books, I think, is kind of oh, in the publishing house. Correcting. I think that's a problem. I mean, if I wrote a book and correct. had it published, uh, I wouldn't want people to go oh, and correcting my book. Um, because they may not be correcting it. They may be yeah. error, error, erroring it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Making it. They, they may think they're correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Martin's book on Seventh-day Adventism will appear in print in a few months, and it will carry a foreword by responsible leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the effect that they have not been misquoted in the volume and that the areas of agreement and disagreement as set forth by Mr. Martin are accurate from their point of view, as well as from our evangelical point of view. All of Mr. Martin's references to a new Adventist volume on their doctrines will be from the page proof of their book, which will appear in print simultaneously with his work. Henceforth, any fair criticism of the Adventist movement must refer to these simultaneous publications. The position of the Adventist seems to be, seems to some of us in a certain, in certain cases to be a new position. To them, it may be merely the position of the majority group of sane leader, leadership, which is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination, to avoid changes that have been brought against them, by, charges that have been brought against them by evangelicals. Adventists have already worked out arrangements that the Voice of Prophecy radio program and the Signs of the Times, their largest paper, be identified as presentations of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that has to do with um, the idea that the Adventist Church has been more clandestine in its approach of uh, uh, creating uh, proselytes and stealing from other people's churches. Anyway. One of the tactics they're, they're yeah. that they are switching the Yeah. Now the thing the thing about the Adventist Church that's kind of interesting is uh, the assembly. Now, however, wait. Let let me yeah. add to that, Theodore. Yeah. It was it, the 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 the, event, the evangelical events that we have, or evangelistic events that we have. Yeah. They hold them in neutral places, but that's part of Spirit of Prophecy Council. Actually, yeah. To avoid avoid what do they call prejudice? What I didn't like is when they 
took this took the letters of Calgary Central Church off the back that were two feet high and could be seen by the C train and and I know people who came to church because of that uh, replaced with like little tiny ones in the front you had to kind of look for it hard mm. but I uh, yeah there was anyway it's not a that's what yeah. I'm saying is it can be a good thing yeah so um yeah the, i mean the thing about the adventist church though presently is the seventh day seventh day adventism has the largest christian presence on the internet of any denomination and uh, why do you think that is why is there more seventh day adventists on the internet than any other denomination well two things that come to my mind uh, opposition and uh so many ideas winds of doctrine okay well winds of doctrine maybe to some degree but most churches if they're going to be on the internet it's going to be their their church that has that internet presence right it's sort of an official presence of a church but adventists have a lot of independent uh ministries Mm. right Mm. other churches don't have this and that's one of the things that a cult That's does not strange. have, right? Cults do not have uh, such diverse uh, activities mm-hmm. and beliefs, actually, as mm-hmm. as what we see in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's one of the things that shows the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a cult. At least Seventh-day Adventists are not generally cult-like in the way that other churches follow their leadership. Though it has mm-hmm. become more and more that way as time has gone on, that there's been this separation between those who just go to church and follow whatever the church does and those that are more independent. So Seventh-day Adventist in some ways is, is quite fractured. And of course, there are lots of other winds of doctrine. Um, but that's mm-hmm. that's sort of developed more over as, t- as time has gone on. Initially, Adventists with their uh, Internet presence weren't so diverse, so so many different groups but it, it is developed um anyway so andreasen is going to close this section he says in closing this paper i wish to reemphasize certain salient facts questions on doctrine page 383 states that christ was exempt the spirit of prophecy makes clear that christ was not exempt from the temptations and passions that afflict men whoever accepts the new theology must reject the testimonies there's no other choice Mr. Martin was instrumental in having our teaching on the mark of the beast and the nature of Christ in the flesh flesh changed. Similar changes were made in other books, but we are not informed what those changes are. Our leaders have promised not to proselytize. This effectively will stop our work for the world, and we have promised to report to Mr. Martin those who transgress. We have been threatened to have the brakes applied on such to such as fail to believe and follow the leaders. Such are characterized as wild-eyed irresponsibles and are said to constitute the lunatic fringe. Kind of reminds me of something that uh, Hillary Clinton said regarding a certain class of people. But anyway, uh, we are appalled to learn that in some way these evangelical clergymen have had enough influence with our leaders to cause the voice of prophecy and the signs of the times to trim their sails to avoid charges that have been brought against them by evangelicals. This is terrifying news. These organs are instruments of God, and it is unbelievable that the leader should permit any outside influence to affect them. In this great sin against the denomination has been committed. Uh, in this, a great sin against the denomination has been committed that can be blotted out only by deep repentance of the guilty parties, or in lieu of this, that the men concerned quietly resigned from holy office, which of course did not occur. Our members are largely unaware of the conditions existing and every effort is being made to keep them in ignorance. Orders have been issued to keep everything secret. And it will be noted that even at the late general conference session in 1958, no report was given of our leaders um, trafficking with the evangelicals and making alliances with them. Our officials are playing with fire and the resulting Conflagration will fulfill the prediction that the coming Omega will be of a most startling nature. Seven times, (laughs) 
I have asked for a hearing and have been promised one, but only mm. on the condition that I meet privately with certain men and that no record be given me of the proceedings. I've asked for a public hearing, or if it is to be a private one, that a tape recording be made and that I be given a copy. And this has been denied me. As I cannot have such a hearing, I am writing these messages, which contain and will contain what I have said at what I would have said at such a hearing. Can the reader surmise the reason why the officers do not want the hearing, I ask? I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and I love this message that I have preached for so long. I grieve deeply as I see the foundation pillars being destroyed. The blessed truths that have made us what we are abandoned. I'm thankful to be in good health and wish that the blessing of the Lord may be with each reader. We have come to strenuous times and it behooves each to keep close to God in these perilous times. The Lord be with you. So as we mentioned before, and there's still more, this is just the first article. Um, Andreasen's going to be defrocked. That is, he's going to have his uh, credentials removed and he's near the end of his life. And this causes his wife to actually be denied um, his uh, pension. Um, now, they do remedy it later on after he dies. At some point, they, they give him his credentials back. Uh, I don't suppose they expect that he's going to be preaching uh, anything in heaven. But, you know. Seems, seems, seems mean. Yeah. What? It seem it seems mean. I think I'll try the raise your hand thing. And no, no, the no. I won't notice it because I can't. I'm not with that. <laughs> it's just there's a delay. Okay, I'll right? keep. Yeah, yeah. It's bandwidth thing. Well, I forget even what I was going to say. What were you just saying? I'm well, just talking about. You said it was mean that they they did that. They took away. Oh, his mean. Credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I even have a friend that happened to. You. You know, twenty years ago, but yeah, I know it was, mean. It was mean. What's it? What's yeah. It? Okay. Um. So we're going to keep going here. Just start reading some of this. Uh, chapter two: Attempted tampering. Early in the summer of 1957, I placed in my hands. I had placed in my hands providentially. I believe <clears throat> a copy of the minutes of the White Board of Trustees for May of that year. So that's the LNG White Board, I, I think. For those who are not familiar with this board, I may state that it is a small committee appointed to have in trust the large volume of letters, manuscripts, and books left by the late Mrs. E.G. White. In counsel with the officers of the denomination, the board decides who is to have access to the material and to what extent and for what purpose, what is to be published and what is not and what material is not to be made available at all. Much of the work of the committee consists in examining and editing these writings and recommending for publication such matter as appears to be of permanent value. This work is of great importance to the church, for only that which is released by the board sees the light of day. And during her lifetime, Mrs. White herself did much of the work of selecting and editing. And in all cases, she had the oversight of what was done. All knew that whatever was published was under supervision, that it had her approval. The board has now taken over this work. Now, of course, we know that the, all these letters and manuscripts were released in 2015, and uh, which was uh, the 100th anniversary of Ellen White's death, correct? It was July, was it July 16th, 2015? Iran? That, that includes think, one on yeah. Nashville. 2015, July 6. July 16 or 15? 16. 16, okay. Yeah, so, so I mean, but back at this time, um, you know, you can think about it. It's, you know, 35 years or more, 40 years after she has, has passed away. And, and um you know, some of the materials, you know, personal letters and things like that. And, and Ellen White would take things that she had written and um, edit them for publish, publication, right? So they were continuing this work. Um, according to the White Minutes, it was on the first day of May, 
1957, the two men, members of the committee, which had been appointed to write the book that came to be known as Questions on Doctrine, were invited by the board to meet with them to discuss a question that had received some consideration at a meeting the previous January. It concerned statements made by Mrs. White in regard to the atonement now in progress in the sanctuary above. This conception did not agree with the conclusions reached by the leaders of the denomination in council with the evangelicals. To understand this fully and its importance, it is necessary to review some history. The Adventist leaders um, had for some time been in contact with two ministers of another faith, evangelicals Bar Dr. Barnhouse and Mr. Martin, respectively editor and assistant editor of the religious journal Eternity, published in Philadelphia, and had discussed with them various of our doctrines. In these conversations, as in the numerous letters that passed between them, the evangelicals had raised serious objections to some of our beliefs. But the question of greatest importance was whether Adventists could be considered Christians while holding such views as the doctrine of the sanctuary, the 2300 days, the date 1844, the investigative judgment, and Christ's atoning work in the sanctuary in heaven since 1844. Our men expressed the desire that the Adventist church be reckoned as one of the regular Protestant churches, a Christian church, and not a sect. Now, so we can see that, that there is this desire not to be considered a sect or a cult, really, is, is really the issue. Um, in the belief that somehow being labeled as a cult has made it difficult for us to evangelize. And so that if we can get sort of the label removed by the evangelicals, that might open the door uh, to evangelism. That's sort of the idea uh, that is that is behind at least their reasoning that they express in, in answering these questions and changing our doctrines to make Adventism it's, a little less uh, it's it's inside. it's also it's also a, something that our schools did our educational institutions uh, going for well, I, don't, I forget certification academic certification and qualifies you. sorry again accreditation accreditation thank you yeah and a lot of things were what you call compromised at that time. Especially in September. brought in. Yeah, a set, also in September of uh, 2001, dealing with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. having the teaching spiritual uh, spiritual formation, uh, so, spiritual that formation. Our, so that our ministers' uh, degrees could be recognized by other denominations. And the question is, why would a Seventh-day Adventist minister need to have his... Mm -hmm theological degree recognized by another denomination. I would I would say follow the money. Well, I don't know. I mean, are Adventist ministers getting I, jobs I, in other denominations or were we just training ministers in other denominations no. were using? No, no, I don't think that's it. I think it's I think it's that uh yeah, that's an interesting question actually. I, I think it's more just has to do with the philosophy of belief within Adventism, hmm. that there are many Adventists who want to be just regular Christians. I mean, we can see that with Spectrum magazine, you know, that, hmm. that they want to be, they want to be recognized yeah. by the world. Yeah. The, yeah. Kind of yeah. Woke, woke side of Adventism. Um, but another reason would be to calm calm the objections from the their pastors yeah. the shepherds of those churches won't be warning them that we're wolves yeah yeah i don't know all, all i know is that um, it doesn't work you know that logic but yeah it, it's an excuse that's thinking. given but i don't think it's the real reason mm, excuse Right. So okay. I think the real reason has Any ideas. Well, I mean, I, I think Adventists are, are generally world worldly. They want to be accepted by the world. They're, they're like any other person. Mm. 
you know, in the world. They, they're not interested in the cross of Christ um, and dying to self. Mm. And, and it's just, we, we become a worldly church. And so the idea of standing out and being is, is, not, is not desirable to them. It was either you or another friend of us. We were, we were talking about that, uh, that Adventists are blessed. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists are blessed. And what, wherever they are, God takes care of them in ways that others can, I don't know. It's not like we're special like that. But well, we, well, we, have we have light. Other There's a higher them. standard of living and so on. Yeah, and, There's and, a higher standard yeah, of living that light, so if you join the church. Yeah, that, well, yeah, we, we have uh, teachings that relate. And live the lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. But but yeah. I, I don't think... So it's a good lifestyle. Yeah, though I think many Adventists, uh, to them the lifestyle is just is like being in a cult as well, where they just, they live this lifestyle, they become, you know, sort of just thinking that that, that is what Adventism is, but it's not just a lifestyle. <laughs> Here's here's kind of excuse me I believe inspired testimonies testimony of how to tell the spiritual the spiritual thermometer of the church and that is see who's at midweek prayer meeting and that's how many you know kinda well it depends on the church I mean, and how far you have hundred yeah a hundred hundred percent cannot be there but the the prayer meeting is Ellen White says something about that. That they'll, we will be the 144,000 that will be found among the prayer meeting, the camp meetings, where occasions for the Holy Spirit is. Yeah, I mean, some people like me, I've, I've always worked in the evening. I can't go to a prayer meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's you know, it's when I work. Well, I wasn't talking about you. No, I'm just saying <laughs> that there are people who can't. But and, you're and just it's... saying there are exceptions, and and, and of course there. Right. Are. I mean, myself, right. I was a shift worker for 12, 12 years, yeah. so yeah. I understand that. And I'm also, how saying. far you live from the church. people are the people that are at prayer meeting are typically like they they seem to be more. Um, yeah. I don't know whether it's calm or you know even humble. I might say I don't know. Yeah, and the other way around. Of course, all yeah. kinds come to prayer meeting. But sorry for that rabbit okay. trail. Russian, I'm part yeah. Russian. Yeah, the two groups spent hundreds yeah. of hours studying and wrote many hundreds of pages. Uh, the evangelicals visited our headquarters in Tacoma Park, and our men visited Philadelphia and were guests of Doctor Barnhouse in his comfortable home. From time to time, other men were called into consultation on such matters as the voice of prophecy and our periodicals, all with the view of ascertaining what stood in the way of our being recognized as a Christian denomination. After long and protracted discussions, uh, the two parties came at last to a working agreement. And though the evangelicals still objected to a number of our doctrines, they were willing to recognize us as Christians. Well, that's good of them. And we would need to make some changes in some of our books in regard to the mark of the beast and also regarding the nature of Christ will in the flesh. Well, that's not so good of our leaders. Eternity, September 1956. This was brought to the attention of the general conference um, officers that the situation might be remedied and such publications might be corrected. Uh, the corrections were made, and this action of the Seventh-day Adventists was indicative of similar steps that were taken subsequently. Um, again, from the Eternity, September 1956. We are not informed what other books were remedied and corrected. The evangelicals published a report of their conferences with the Adventists in Eternity, from which the above quotations are taken. Dr. Barnhouse states that they took the precaution to submit their manuscript to the Adventists so that no misstatement or error might occur. The Adventists published no report. Even at the general conference session last year, the matter was not discussed. Only a few knew that there had been any conferences with the evangelicals. But there were rumors that the Adventist leaders had been in conference with the evangelicals, but it was considered by some only as hearsay. The few who did know kept their counsel. There seemed to be a conspiracy of secrecy. Till this day, we do not know and are not supposed to know who carried on the conferences with the evangelicals. 
who do not know and are not supposed to know who wrote questions on doctrine. Diligent inquiry produce no result. We do not know and are not supposed to know just what changes were made and in what books concerning the mark of the beast and the nature of Christ will in the flesh. We do not know who authorized the omission of the 13th chapter of Revelation in our Sabbath school lessons for the second quarter of 1958, which deals with the mark of the beast. Dr. Barnhouse reports that to avoid charges brought against them by the evangelicals, the Adventists worked out arrangements that concern the voice of prophecy and the signs of the times. What was worked out, we do not know and are not told. Should we not have a detailed report? We, of course, also wonder how it came to pass that ministers of another denomination had any voice or any say whatsoever in how we conduct our work. Have our leaders abdicated? How is it that they consult the evangelicals and keep our own people in the dark? Now, the one thing, of course, that um, I hate is secrecy. We should do. We should be as open as the day. Yeah, uh, we shouldn't work in darkness. Amen. We saw that with Transpar- um, transparency has become transparency has become a key word for me. Yeah. Well, the, re- yeah, the reason why people do things in the dark is because what they're doing, they don't want people to see it. And you have to think, why don't they want people to see it? Right. Well, this is a middle of darkness. <laughs> They don't want to be seen. It's, men love the darkness lest their deeds should come to the light. Mm-hmm. We love the darkness because people Our deeds love are evil. the darkness because, we, yeah, we love doing it. Otherwise, we would be saints like, yeah. Yeah, like Jesus. Yeah. We love doing sin. Now, now, this next section is really interesting, but we're going to look at this next week. And, uh, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I wanted to add yeah, that not only so. do we love that we love sin, but that there's a love hatred relationship with it when we become yeah. a Christian. We get to be at war with ourselves. Yeah. Okay, so, Jeff. Yeah. I'll just say this is new to me, you know. Okay. Of church having secret meetings like that. Yeah, I, yeah. I wonder how many people it's new to, you know, like how many people in Adventism know about what happened in the 1950s. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've yeah, known about, right. You know, pretty much from when I be, first became an Adventist, as as you know, because the first book I read was Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. So I was aware of what the evangelicals had said about these meetings. Um, so, you know, that's within a couple of weeks of being baptized that I began reading this book. And, and the reason I, I read it, you know, I was baptized on Christmas Day. On the next weekend, I didn't go to church. Uh, uh, we had gone to uh, uh, teen time, which we had been attending uh, to their, their New Year's retreat. And they did a series on cults, um, Christian science, Mormons, uh, can't remember what the other ones were. Uh, Jehovah's Witness. And so there was four different cults. Um, and so I asked the pastor, Paul, um, you know, uh, I just became an Adventist. You know, did I join a cult? And he says, no, read the book Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so I read it, but I did recognize that there were things that Adventists believed uh that uh, that i believed that the church had changed because it, i was pretty aware of the nature of christ and 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 those types of issues I also understood that um the 2300 days the little i knew about it when i became an adventist was was an issue um that the sanctuary message was something that was distinct in adventism and so that that became one of my main studies but also the nature of Christ. So I knew about that and, um, and the sanctuary. So these were things that, that I, I continued to study as an Adventist, but I had questions about. So I wasn't, I wasn't really comforted that uh, 
the evangelicals didn't see us as a cult anymore. That didn't really matter to me, um, especially as I read about what a cult is. Raising my hand, raising my hand. Yeah. I, uh, I find it interesting that, that the upper room study group, how we all studied those things, but have gone so many different ways afterwards on that issue. You mean within Adventist and others, people we no, know? Within the, within the upper, within, yeah, yeah within the study group in, in the church that are, you know, there are all, all our old friends and so on. Yeah. Um, but uh, each kind of went, I don't know, went astray. Well, I would say the, up, the upper agreed room. Agreed on that we were united on. Well, the upper room youth okay. group is still generally more conservative than the standard Adventists, like the people that we yeah. study. Oh yeah, but but yeah. some of them have have flipped over to, um, you know. Well, I know uh, Dave Bodwin says left, right. Well, Dave Bodwin says that you know uh, last generation theology, which is what you know M. L. Andreessen mm-hmm. teaches, what Ellen White teaches, what A. T. Jones taught, is is a dangerous. Which is that uh, we can be perfect or not sin. And be like Jesus. Yeah, the final generation, one hundred forty-four thousand overcoming sin. Yep. That that's a dangerous yeah. teaching. So for yeah. Dave Goldwyn to, I haven't talked to Daryl about it. Uh, his twin brother, uh, Daryl. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he takes that position, but that's what Dave Goldwyn did, mm-hmm. as well as Keith Richter, who's uh, able to conference mm, yeah. president. Right. Yeah. Um, so these were pretty conservative people. But, uh, yeah, so obviously they've compromised in that area. Uh, doesn't make us better than them or anything. It's just, you know, there's things that we believe to be true that are pretty clearly taught in the spirit of prophecy, and they've abandoned those things. Yeah, so, I, um, I don't uh, say say one was better than the other other than just that it's different, and it's so much uh, diversity and the uni- unity of one thing has got to happen somehow, too. Great. Okay. So anyone else before we close this prayer? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, as Jeff said, you know, there's lots of people that don't know these things. He didn't know these things. And this isn't some conspiracy theory. This is something that's totally solid of what happened. Um, but the church has, has sort of whitewashed this whole issue so that if you I, read I was going to say that. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that. I, I, thanks for sharing this because I, I wasn't aware of it, and I'm like, how, how did I? Did, how come I didn't know that these details? Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Hmm. Okay. Probably heard rum, rumblings of it, but didn't pay attention. Probably never put it all together. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear gracious heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have. We Lord, we have appreciated um, the fellowship that we have with you and with each other. Uh, Kelly and I think back to the upper room and the way that you worked in our lives so many years ago. And we know, Lord, that um, there's much work that you still need to do. It looks like uh, more work than we ever thought. Um, But we just ask, Lord, that we can uh, cling to Christ as Jacob did that we can not let go except you bless us. We know, Lord, that there's nothing that we offer to you other than everything we are, which is nothing. And uh, you give us everything in exchange, which is everything you are. We pray for one another, Lord. We know the struggles that we face in this life and the dangers uh, that lie in our paths. And we have seen in this movement And within Adventism, so many people appear to embrace the truth for a time, uh, but that they fall off the path into the dark, wicked world below. And we ask, Lord, that um, we can rescue all that you bring in our paths, but especially our own souls, Lord. Um, We pray for the the meetings tomorrow uh, that... uh, your spirit will be present and that you can help us in our personal struggles. 
um, in understanding these truths. Be with each one. Give us a good rest tonight. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.